Now we move into our final unit, and this final unit is titled Into the 21st Century, from 2001 to present. And this really will cover the presidencies of George W. Bush and Barack Obama. And so we start here with our learning objectives. Explain the issues that made the 2000 presidential election so controversial. Describe how September 11, 2001 terrorist attacks changed the world. And describe the effects of the subprime mortgage crisis. And describe the major issues of the 2008 presidential election. So starting by looking at the 2000 presidential election. As we mentioned previously, Vice President Al Gore was running for the Democratic Party nomination and received the Democratic Party nomination. And he ran against then Texas Governor George W. Bush, the son of George H.W. Bush, who was Clinton's predecessor. And so Bush ran, of course, as the Republican candidate. So there were numerous problems with this 2000 presidential election. Uh, number one, uh, Al Gore actually wins the popular vote, but loses in the Electoral College. It's the Electoral College that determines the president. That's the way the Constitution was set up. It's the way it's always been. Normally, the candidate who wins the Electoral College also wins the popular vote. Once in a while, that doesn't happen. And when it doesn't happen, it always becomes controversial. And of course, obviously, this is no, no exception. But adding to the controversy are, are numerous problems that surface. Uh, on election night, before the polls were closed on the West Coast, the media was projecting Al Gore as the winner. A short time later, they revised their call and projected Bush as the winner. The election came down to the state of Florida. Whichever candidate took Florida would win the election. The election was very close in Florida. Late in the evening, it was announced that George W. Bush had won the election, and as news crews waited for Gore's concession speech, it was announced that Gore was not conceding. Uh, there were numerous problems with the voting, and Gore was requesting recounts in select counties in Florida. And there were numerous ballot problems. One included the infamous butterfly ballots, uh, and they also were what we call punch card ballots. Uh, the punch card ballots used in Florida could lead to several problems with regards to interpreting the will of the voter. Some ballots were not completely punched, leaving what became, becomes known as dangling chads, which is basically just a little piece uh, that isn't punched all the way out. And then there becomes a problem interpreting the will of the voter. If Clearly, if, if there's a hole there, if, it, if the punch card has been completely punched, that clearly counts as a vote. If there's no evidence that anybody attempted to punch at all, then there's no vote. But what do you do if one's partially punched? Does that count? Well, how far punched does it have to be? Does an indentation count? Uh, you know, all of these things have to be considered. And a lot of you may not recall this. We, you know, in modern elections, we now tend to use what's a little closer to a scantron. You kind of bubble in a, a little box. But on those old punch card machines, you actually had to insert your ballot into the punch card and there was a lever that went up and down and you had to kind of lock it into the right the right position and when you were locked there and ready to cast your vote you press down on the handle and it punched out the little the little chad um, well Florida's ballot was even more difficult because there's what you call a butterfly ballot where they had candidates listed on both sides with little arrows that pointed to, to different lines in the middle and quite literally, it should alternate. So the first candidate would be the top hole, the second hole would be for the candidate on the right, on the top, and then the, the next one would be the next candidate on the left, next candidate on the right, but it would be very easy for somebody to cast a ballot to mark for the wrong spot. Uh, and of course, this becomes tremendously confusing for people uh, because, once again, when you notice a weird anomaly, a lot of votes for a candidate that normally you you wouldn't expect to do very well. Uh, is it because people marked the wrong spot thinking they were voting for someone else? Uh, that becomes an issue. And so, uh, like I said, there were numerous problems just to even try to interpret the will of the voters. And so the recounts start. 
Uh, after the election on November 7th, hand recounts started in select counties in Florida. The original deadline for the recounts was November 14th. That gives them one week. Uh, you have different uh, people working with, working with the recounts, some Republicans, some Democrats. They oftentimes bicker and, and don't agree. Uh, television coverage was full of people holding up the, the ballots to the light to see if there was any indication of an intent to cast a vote. And the whole thing ends up, you know, it just drags on. Uh, eventually, they extend the deadline for the recounts by the Florida Supreme Court. Uh, they, they agree to extend that deadline out until November 26th. Of course, that date comes and goes. Uh, the battle over the recounts persisted until on December 12th, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that the recounts must stop, ultimately determining that they weren't going to be able to actually uh, recount all of the ballots within a reasonable time frame. And therefore, if they couldn't complete all the recounts, then they couldn't really count any of the recounts. The original tally had to stand. The original tally left Bush uh, with the most votes in Florida. He wins Florida. He wins in the Electoral College to despite not winning the popular vote. So Bush is declared the winner. Uh, but of course this leaves many people, over half the people that voted, voted for, for Al Gore. Uh, they feel disenfranchised. And once again there was a third party candidate, Ralph Nader, uh, who's run a few times, but his best showing really was in that 2000 presidential election. Common uh, belief is that he most likely pulled votes away from, uh, from Al Gore because uh, he certainly is much more liberal. Uh, he would have pull, pulled votes probably that would have otherwise went to Gore. Uh, so that ultimately is really what determines this election. So now we're going to take a look at Bush, the Bush, actual Bush presidency. Uh, so Bush goes ahead and takes office. He received 271 electoral votes to win the election, but took only 47.9% of the popular vote, with Gore taking 48.4%. Uh, still, very close margin uh, between the two, uh, you know, really less than a, than a full percentage point uh, between the two candidates, really about, well, literally half a percent separated them in the popular vote, uh, but, uh, you know, it was what it was. Uh, Bush won the Electoral College, so Bush takes, takes the office, but of course you still have a lot of people feeling like Bush stole the election, and it really becomes kind of a lose-lose proposition, because had, had things come out the other way with Gore um, being declared the winner, uh, undoubtedly roughly about half the people that voted would have felt that, the, that, that Gore had stole the election. Uh, so this creates a very difficult situation. People were concerned. Uh, Bush certainly lacked a clear mandate to govern. Uh, and a lot of times people talk about that, but that's, you know, once again, the expressed will of the voters. And certainly Bush lacked that as less than half the people that voted uh, had voted for him. And so there was a, a great deal of concern over whether or not Bush would be able to govern effectively uh, given that fact that the country was so divided by the election. Ultimately, things didn't prove to be too bad. Uh, once again, as we, as we mentioned with the dot-coms, early into Bush's first term, several dot-coms or internet-based businesses began to fail, and the economy slipped into a recession. Uh, to stimulate the economy, Bush pushed for tax cuts. The cuts, combined with increased government spending, though, turned what had been a budget surplus left behind by Bill Clinton. In other words, when Bill Clinton left the White House, we were running budget surpluses. The government was actually spending less money than it was taking in. But rapidly, we shifted back into deficit spending. We began to spend more money than we were taking in. And like I said, a couple of effects, uh, or a couple of re uh, you know, a couple things there. We've increased government spending. At the same time, we're decreasing government revenue by cutting taxes hoping that stimulates the economy. Uh, another thing that Bush pushed for when he got in was his education reform known as No Child Left Behind, or Nickleby, as it's sometimes been referred to as the acronym. Uh, Bush's plan for improving our schools becomes known as No Child Left Behind, and it requires schools, uh, required schools to have highly qualified teachers in every classroom. 
Uh, the program that was widely criticized by educators for creating unfunded mandates and also along with the whole system of ranking schools uh, and, and requiring mandated testing uh, to rank these schools, uh, which has of course become very controversial as well. Many people, many critics feel like we're well over tested, uh, but it doesn't seem like it's going away. Um, on the domestic scene, Bush wanted to reform Medicare, and he pushed through a bill to add prescription drug benefits to Medicare. A series of corporate scandals led Congress to tighten accounting regulations and increase penalties for dishonest corporate executives, and Bush also pushed for strategic defense programs as a part of restoring the military. Then, fairly early into Bush's first term, we hit the September 11th, 2001 terrorist attacks. So on the morning of September 11th, uh, terrorists hijacked four planes. Two planes were crashed into the Twin Towers of the World Trade Center in New York. One plane was crashed into the Pentagon, and a fourth plane crashed into a field in Pennsylvania when the passengers tried to retake the plane, uh, which prevented it from actually hitting its intended target. Uh, all in all, 2,973 victims died in the attacks, plus all 19 hijackers that were involved. Um, of course, the attacks has quite an impact on the United States uh, and actually on the world. It really changes the way in which we look at things. Uh, most Americans, uh, you know, when they look for an, an event to compare this to, there was a strong tendency to try to compare the September 11th attacks to uh, Pearl Harbor. It was probably the closest thing in terms of the shock value and the, the loss of life. Uh, but in many ways, this was even more shocking, partially because this wasn't directed at our military, but this was directed at civilians. And, and when this happens, uh, this was you know, really televised live. Uh, you know, few people saw the first plane hit, but many Americans, myself included, were watching the news and actually saw the second plane hit the second tower and then watched the towers collapse and, you know, began to see the events of that day unfold on live television. Um, and it really gave us a whole new way of looking at the world. And obviously, um, you know, as a natural consequence, we want to hold the parties that are responsible, we want to hold them responsible for their actions, but it becomes particularly difficult in the case of the September 11th attacks because, you know, unlike Pearl Harbor where we were attacked by a country, Japan, we know who the enemy is, we know who to go after. But in the case of the September 11th, uh, 2001 terrorist attacks, the attack was carried out by a terrorist group known as Al Qaeda. Uh, so you know, soon after the attacks. Osama bin Laden, the leader of Al-Qaeda, claimed credit for the attacks and, you know, he became really our most wanted. The problem is, once again, is that fighting against something like terror, which is an, an ideology, is particularly difficult to fight against. And even a group like Al-Qaeda, you can take out Osama bin Laden, but, you know, he's the head of the organization, but more heads may pop up. And that's really kind of been the case. It took us uh, 10 years, roughly, to track down and, and to kill Osama bin Laden. But there are still uh, members of al-Qaeda out there. There are new leaders that are rising up. So we still have a terrorist threat. This hasn't gone away, sadly. Um, Al-Qaeda, as we mentioned, did have, have training camps in Afghanistan. So the U.S. demanded that the Taliban, which was the ruling government there, hand over Osama bin Laden to the United States. They refused, so we went in with our forces and toppled the Taliban. We helped set up a, a new government there uh, with Hamid Karzai as the, as the new uh, leader. And then we have stayed there, and still to this day, we still have troops fighting over there, fighting against uh, remnants of the Taliban and remnants of Al-Qaeda that are hiding out in the Hindu Kush mountain range uh, along the border with Pakistan. And so we're, we continue to fight them there. 
Uh, and as we mentioned, we, we did eventually capture Osama bin Laden, but it took us a long time. Now, looking at modern terrorism, uh, most terrorism directed at the U.S. today comes from Islamic fundamentalists, although we have had some incidents of domestic terrorism, like the 1995 Oklahoma City bombing. And the primary issues that have turned many Middle Eastern groups against the United States is one, Western influence in the Middle East, and two, the United States' support of Israel. Uh, we also have a, developed a problem known as state-sponsored terrorism, and that's basically where a government sponsors acts of terror. Libya, Syria, and Iraq have all been nations that were known to have sponsored terrorist activity. Uh, in Libya, a revolution that started in 2001, I'm sorry, 2011, rather. Uh, in, in Libya, a, a revolution that started in 2011 toppled Muammar Gaddafi, their longtime ruler. Um, so, you know, he, he had, had been clearly a sponsor of acts of terror, including being the sponsor of the uh, bombing of, of flight uh, Pan Am 103 over Lockerbie, Scotland. Uh, but Syria, their, their government still is believed to uh, engage in acts of terror. Currently there's a civil war going on in Syria as well and and both the government and the rebels have group ties to terrorist organizations which is a particular concern for the United States. Uh, the government's linked to Hezbollah, uh, a terrorist group out of the Middle East that usually targets Israel while the the rebels seem to be affiliated with Al-Qaeda. Um, so you know that remains a big concern. Uh, Iraq well, the government there was under Saddam Hussein, who was believed to be a sponsor of terror. Uh, of course, we end up going after them, and Saddam Hussein is no longer the ruler. And this brings us now to Bush's access of evil speech. So Bush made reference to an access of evil or rogue nations that supported terrorism and, and or are seeking weapons of mass destruction, or WMDs, and he mentioned specifically Iran, Iraq, and North Korea as nations that made up this axis of evil. And of course, we ended up um, going to war in Iraq, and we still have uh, tense relations with Iran. Sanctions have been in place for a long time. We've recently begun negotiations with them to try to get them to curb their nuclear program. North Korea, we know they have nuclear weapons. They remain a big concern. Uh, they're a big threat, not so much to the United States, even though their, their new leader, Kim Jong-un, has threatened the United States, uh, threatened to use nuclear weapons against us. Uh, nobody really takes him seriously. He's been likened to uh, a barking dog uh, locked inside a car with rolled up windows. Uh, you know, not really much of a threat. Uh, but, nonetheless, he remains a big threat to a couple U.S. allies, particularly South Korea, which, which they share a border and have previously been at war with, and also with Japan, who is a strong U.S. ally. So um, North Korea remains kind of on our radar. So now we're going to look at the Iraq War of 2003, uh, believing that Iraq either possessed WMDs or were developing them, the United States with the assistance of other countries, invaded Iraq in March of 2003. Three weeks into the invasion, they had reached the capital city of Baghdad. So all in all, things go pretty quickly with us going in and actually toppling the regime of Saddam Hussein. Uh, even as we were uh, really right on the outskirts of Baghdad, uh, the Minister of Information, guy that becomes known as Baghdad Bob, uh, kind of as a spokesperson for the Iraqi government. He's frequently denying the American presence, uh, claiming to have the Americans on the run, even when people realize that wasn't the case. Uh, Saddam Hussein was in hiding. It, it took us a long time to actually locate him. Uh, he back, actually hid out, in a, literally, in an underground hole on a farm. Uh, but we did topple his government pretty quickly and then on May 1st, 2003, President Bush declared the end of major combat operations in Iraq, staged a great photo op where uh, 
where he, you know, had a big sign behind him that says mission accomplished and he's seen given the thumbs up. Uh, but sadly, uh, while, you know, the mission of, of toppling the Iraqi government was accomplished, the idea of being able to withdraw our, our troops was still a long ways off. Um, we set up democratic elections in Iraq, but we maintained a presence there for about eight years, uh, finally getting out in 2011. Uh, also, there were a number of controversies that came up. Number one, no WMDs were ever found. Um, you know, that doesn't mean that there was no possibility that they ever existed. You know, there's always a possibility that, that things were smuggled out. Certainly, Saddam Hussein looked guilty because he was kicking out the UN, UN weapons inspectors before the invasion. But, you know, ultimately we never found them. So critics say that, you know, we went in under false pretenses. Uh, critics also say that the war has diverted attention away from the war on terror and that it has destabilized the region. And it's, it's pretty hard to argue that it hasn't. Um, since, since that time, the region has been, become much less stable than it was before. Uh, we've seen numerous revolutions. The whole area is incredibly volatile now. Uh, there's also been criticism of the way that prisoners of war were treated, particularly photographs uh, surfaced uh, from a prison in Baghdad called Abu Ghraib. And the pictures from there showed uh, prisoners of war being mistreated by American soldiers, uh, which, once again, that increased the controversy. Uh, since major combat operations have ended, the U.S. and Iraqi forces have had to deal with insurgents. Uh, tactics have included kidnapping and murder, roadside bombs, suicide bombings, and other terrorist attacks. Uh, and in fact, even though uh, we finally did withdraw our troops, the Iraqi government still has flare-ups that they have to deal with, with insurgents. Uh, Post-9-11 changes here in the United States have also been kind of a response to what happened. Uh, in response to the failure to prevent the terrorist attacks, of 9-11, the United States created the Department of Homeland Security, a whole new department of the executive branch of government, uh, with the goal that it's their responsibility to coordinate information among the CIA, the FBI, and other government agencies. Uh, once again, kind of realizing that in the days and weeks leading up to the 9-11 attacks, uh, if you think of, of kind of this being a puzzle, and having all the puzzle pieces there, it was like not being able to have all the puzzle pieces on the same table because the CIA had their puzzle pieces that they were monitoring and then the FBI had theirs and they weren't coordinating their efforts and so nobody could really get a whole picture of how this whole thing went together until after the, uh, after the attacks. So the perp one of the purposes of Homeland Security is to make sure that this information is being shared, it's being coordinated, they're able to fully analyze this information to help prevent future attacks. Uh, the U.S. also passed the Patriot Act, which gave the government increased rights to investigate suspected terrorists, including the use of wiretaps. Uh, there's still a debate on whether this gives the government too much power to intervene in our private lives. And as we continue on into, into more contemporary times, uh, we've also found out that the NSA has been largely monitoring our phone calls and, and finding that other countries have been, have been uh, really kind of spying on us through, through social media. And so there's all kinds of new issues that are coming to the forefront. But a lot of this was ushered in as some of those post-9-11 changes. Uh, and so it, it really makes us question what... You know, how much leeway should we give? Even things have changed as far as, as airport security. Uh, you know, prior to 9-11, if, if you were going to the airport, let's say you're taking a loved one to the airport, you could actually go back, all the way back to the gate where they were going to board the plane and wait with them and literally uh, watch them walk on the plane. Or once again, if you were picking somebody up from the airport, you could actually go to the gate where they were going to deboard and wait right there where they were coming off the plane. But now that's all changed. Only ticketed passengers get beyond a certain point. And so if you're taking somebody to the airport, uh, it's recommended, especially on an international flight, that you get them there at least two hours in advance. 
Uh, they have to go through the screening process, uh, which is much more extensive now, and they, can, they continue to update it. They do random searches where they'll pull people aside for, for special screenings. <clears throat> um, certainly critics say that this is an invasion of our privacy, but then again, by the same token, um, nobody wants to go through what we went through on September 11th again, and we have not had another terrorist attack since. And now we're going to look at the 2004 presidential election. So in 2004, uh, Bush was pitted against the Democratic candidate, John Kerry. Uh, John Kerry is currently our U.S. Secretary of State, but uh, of course back then he wasn't. He was a senator and, uh, out of Massachusetts, and he was running against uh, Bush. He, so he ran as the Democratic nominee. Uh, one issue was that neither Bush nor Vice President Dick Cheney had served in Vietnam. Kerry was a decorated veteran of the Vietnam War, but he returned a critic of the war, and he was also a critic of the war in Iraq. Bush won the 2004 election, taking 50.7% of the popular vote, first candidate to have had over 50% of the popular vote since his father initially won the 1988 election and he took 286 electoral votes. During Bush's term, uh, numerous issues that he still had to deal with. We still had the Iraq War. We still had the economy to deal with. These are still major issues. And then Hurricane Katrina wrought destruction upon the Gulf Coast, and the government was widely criticized for being slow to respond. Then we kind of hit the subprime mortgage crisis. And so looking at kind of the prelude to this crisis, for many years, housing prices have been increasing at a rapid rate. Many people began to see their homes as an investment and as a source of income. Uh, in fact, some people tapped into home equity lines of credit, you know, pulling out uh, money or borrowing against the equity they had in their homes to finance other things, even sometimes to take vacations. Uh, some export, experts warned that the so-called bubble would burst. In other words, they felt that the housing prices were, were too high and that it wasn't sustained and that the bottom would fall out of the market. Well, ultimately, those experts proved to be correct. In late 2007, the bubble did burst and many people defaulted on their loans and went into foreclosure. As a result, when people go into foreclosure, the banks take over ownership of these homes. Then the homes, of course, are, are usually going to be put back on the market to be sold by the banks to recoup what they've lost. Well, as this happens, there's a, a major flood of houses dumped on the market, and this ties into the forces of supply and demand. That drives housing prices down. Housing prices began to fall rapidly. And the U.S. also kind of simultaneous with this slipped into a recession uh, while the rising prices of oil and inflation worsened the crisis. And many people began to walk away from their homes and many banks failed. Uh, and that's largely due to the fact that uh, you know, with the housing prices, many people ended up being upside down. They owed more than the home was worth. Many people simply walked away. Banks were left with a house that was worth less than what was owed on the property. They couldn't sell it and get their money back out. Uh, there are many different causes to this crisis. Part of it was the boom and bust of the housing market. Speculation also played a role. Many people speculating that housing prices were just going to keep going up. Uh, there was also high-risk mortgage loans and lending and borrowing practices. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes they were giving out no-doc loans, also referred to as liar's loans, where people didn't have to document the income that they had. So people were encouraged to lie and, and say that they had more income than they really did. Uh, and thus, they, people qualified for uh, more expensive homes than they really should have. Uh, the securitization practices also weren't very good. In fact, how they secured a lot of these loans is they were packaged together as uh, mortgage debt and then basically given a, a rating based upon, uh, based upon the, the uh, riskiness of the loans and then they were sold and then what also began to happen is some of these loans may not have 
or some of the, you know, as investments, as securities, they may not have had a AAA rating, but because there, there weren't enough people out there buying or investors buying loans that weren't rated AAA, they began to kind of find some sneaky ways to get the, the, trouble, uh, the AAA rating. That was through what was known as credit default swaps, which was basically buying insurance to, to insure those loans, and then they could have, you know, they buy it from a AAA rated institution, thus they'd have the AAA rating. Uh, so a lot of these, these loans ends, end up being rated higher than they should have been. Uh, plus, many people had inaccurate credit ratings as well and many government policies that were intended to make home ownership easier also contributed to the crisis. Uh, you know, the end result is that uh, a lot of wealth is lost. And so ultimately what ends up happening with several banks start to fail, uh, the government decides to take action. Their biggest concern were the biggest Wall Street banks. And so some of these biggest banks were deemed to be too big to fail and they received a series of bailouts to keep these banks solvent. Now ultimately what happens is government money is given to these banks to to keep them in business with the fear that if these banks go under they're going to be unable to make out loan make loans out to other people and that it's going to hurt the economy even more. Um, in the end I don't know if that's really if that actually would have, would have played out that way uh, but many Americans became very irritated as these wall, large Wall Street banks got bailed out. And at the end of the day, um, we also had to deal with the fact that, um, you know, some of the CEOs of some of, these, some of these companies or other top executives, maybe not the CEOs, but other high-ranking executives received large bonuses to despite the fact that they were receiving taxpayer money to keep them afloat. That really angered many Americans. And uh, the bailouts actually started under Bush, but they carried into the Obama administration as well. And then the American automobile companies also sought government bailouts uh, because of their sales dropped tremendously during this time period. Part of that was that a lot of, a lot of the American manufacturers were making cars that weren't so fuel efficient and gas prices were skyrocketing, which uh, along with the, with the bad economy, people couldn't afford that. So uh, people, instead of looking to buy new cars, or if they were looking to buy new cars, they were looking to buy some foreign cars that were more fuel efficient. Uh, so the American automobile manufacturers, many of them began to seek bailouts and began to reorganize and began to really uh, produce some better cars, trying to meet that consumer need. Uh, and they have stayed afloat, so the bailouts in a lot of ways could be seen as a success. But once again, both cases, you've got big business being bailed out by the government. And now we're going to look at the 2008 presidential election. And during the Democratic primaries, it became obvious that the Democratic Party's ticket would make history. The front runners were Senator Barack Obama and Senator Hillary Rodham Clinton. Uh, Barack Obama was, of course, African American, and Hillary Rodham Clinton female. Uh, these were the leading two candidates and it became obvious that one of those two candidates would win the nomination and thus it would be history making. We, we would either have the first African American to head a major party ticket uh, or we would have the first woman to head a major party ticket. In the end uh, it would be of course Barack Obama not only would win the nomination but then would go on to win the presidency. Now looking at the general election, it also became very apparent that, that the election results were going to be groundbreaking because to run against Obama, the Republicans chose Senator John McCain and he chose Alaskan Governor Sarah Palin as his running mate. Now this uh, once again puts a female on a major party ticket and this is only the second time in history that a, a woman had been on a major party ticket. The first was back in 1984 when Walter Mondale, the Democratic nominee, chose Geraldine Ferraro as his running mate. But now you've got the Republicans that have done the same. And so, once again, we now know that the election results would either give us the first African-American president or the first female vice president, depending on which way it turned out. 
Um, the end result, of course, is that Obama wins the election and becomes the first African American. Obama wins, taking 52.9% of the electoral vote, which by many, many measures could be considered a landslide, and really did win by a landslide in the Electoral College, taking 365 electoral votes. Uh, Obama became the first African American to be elected to the highest office in the United States. Reasons for his victory? Many Americans had grown tired of the war in Iraq and the recession that hit the subprime mortgage crisis. Obama presented himself as the candidate of change, while McCain differed very little from Bush on issues that were important to many Americans. And of course, this also made it very easy for Obama to paint himself as a candidate of change because he could kind of use McCain's own words against him. For example, McCain had infamously stated that he had voted with the president 90% of the time. Uh, at a time when many Americans were looking for a change, uh, I think McCain could have done himself some favors by, by clearly uh, differentiating where he, where he stood on issues that was different than Bush and how his agenda would be different than Bush's. Ultimately, uh, he didn't really do that, and many Americans were seeking a change. So that played a major role, I believe, in Obama winning the election. Now, of course, uh, when Obama comes into the White House, we are now in the worst recession since the Great Depression. And so the first order of business for Obama was to deal with the economy. Uh, the economy has shown signs of recovery. We continue to, to move forward. We're really pretty much out of the recession, but uh, you know, unemployment, it, while it's coming down, it's coming down slowly. Uh, and other things that are kind of contributing to the difficulty are rising commodity prices, uh, sometimes higher gas prices, and rising consumer costs for food. Healthcare reform becomes a major push for Obama, uh, and this, of course, had long been a major concern of the Democratic Party, with Democrats not only winning the presidency, but gaining control of Congress, uh, having both houses of Congress in 2008, they were able to pass a health care bill. Uh, this health care bill is known as the Affordable Care Act, but more commonly referred to as Obamacare. Uh, and this is, once again, something the Democratic Party have been pushing for since the Roosevelt administration. Uh, a lot still remains very controversial about Obamacare. The Republicans have voted numerous times to try to repeal it uh, unsuccessfully. But it, it has gone into effect. Some parts of it are pretty popular, some parts less popular. As far as foreign affairs, the U.S. has scaled back involvement in Iraq, but fighting with the Taliban and al-Qaeda forces has increased in Afghanistan. Obama signed the uh, treaty with Russia in which both countries agree to reduce nuclear weapons. Nuclear proliferation remains a threat as Iran and North Korea appear to be pursuing nuclear weapons technology. We know North Korea has it. What they don't have is intermediate or long-range missiles, really, that we believe are capable of carrying a nuclear warhead. Uh, however, they're working on that as well. Um, and then, as I mentioned, Iran, uh, we are making some progress there in terms of having better diplomatic relations and having a discussion uh, about you know, trying to find a solution to the issue, but yet that still is far from being a done deal at this point. Uh, and here's a quote from Barack Obama. He said, quote, I believe that the United States has a unique responsibility to act, indeed. We have a moral obligation. I say this as a president of the only nation ever to use nuclear weapons. I say it as a commander in chief who knows that our nuclear codes are never far from my side. Most of all, I say it as a father who wants my two young daughters to grow up in a world where everything they know and love cannot be instantly wiped out. That is a quote from US President Barack Obama calling for the United States and Russia to pursue new reductions in their respective nuclear arsenals. Now, once again, just like all presidents, uh, Obama faces midterm elections in 2010. 
So after the 2008 election, the Democrats had control of the White House and uh, both houses of Congress. The economy remained an issue headed into the 2010 midterm elections. The Tea Party Express, a coalition of extreme conservatism, emerged led by former Alaska governor and vice presidential nominee Sarah Palin. The Republican Party gained control of the House of Representatives, but not the Senate in the midterm elections. Some Republicans blamed the Tea Party for the failure to win the Senate. So looking at Republican control of the House, with the victories in the midterm elections, John Boehner of the Republican Party became Speaker of the House. The Republicans set out to repeal Obamacare and to reduce spending. The stage was set for confrontation as the Democrats still controlled the Senate and the White House. Many Tea Party-backed Republicans have pledged to reduce government spending and cut taxes. Uh, this has actually led to numerous standoffs, the threat of default numerous times, and eventually uh, actually led to a government shutdown in late 2012, or I'm sorry, late, no, I'm sorry, late 2013, rather. Uh, on May 2nd of 2011, bin Laden, referring back to Osama bin Laden, was killed at a private compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, by United States Navy SEALs in a covert operation authorized by President Barack Obama. Uh, of course, this is widely celebrated here in the United States because he really had become enemy number one. Uh, now, of course, in the time since, we still have to deal with uh, an ongoing threat. Uh, and then looking at the 2012 presidential election, the Republican primary started very early and featured several candidates squaring off in numerous debates. In the end, former Massachusetts Governor Mitt Romney won the Republican nomination and the economy remained a major issue in, 2000, in the 2012 elections. To despite the slow economic recover, recovery, voters re-elected Barack Obama. Republicans main, came, maintained control of the House of Representatives, so things changed very little uh, in terms of the basic balance of government. We still have the Democrats controlling the Senate, we still have Barack Obama as the President, and we still have Republicans controlling the House of Representatives. Uh, after the government shut down, the Republicans, once again, largely took the blame for that. And as a result, we have started to see uh, some shifting and a little bit more compromise. And now it seems like we have a more functional government that's able to get some things done. So hopefully uh, this will continue as we move forward uh, into 2014 and beyond.